Good morning. Welcome to the University of Pretoria celebration of the International Day of Mathematics, which is informally known as Pi Day. My name is Dr. Eder Kikianti. I'm a senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of Pretoria. Joining me today as my fellow host is Dr. Mick Messerschmidt, also a senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of Pretoria. Good morning. The theme for 2021's International Day of Mathematics is Mathematics for a Better World. Our goal for this live event is to celebrate our and hopefully your passion for mathematics with our friends and colleagues. The program today will include two talks by internationally regarded professors in pure and applied mathematics from the University of Pretoria, followed by a panel discussion on mathematics, 
and its landscape in South Africa. Me. Uh, thank you, Ida. Uh, we open today's event uh, with a message from the acting head of department uh, of uh, mathematics and applied mathematics at the University of Pretoria, Professor Jan Harm van Avalt. Professor van Avalt. Good morning. I'm Jan Harm van der Walt, the acting head of the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics at the University of Pretoria. Thank you for joining us today as we celebrate mathematics and its place in the world. Some people may think that mathematics is a strange and mysterious business practiced by bespectacled professors in dimly lit offices. But let me tell you, and I hope that you will leave here today convinced of this fact, that you don't need a PhD to, to appreciate mathematics. We all marvel at the stark symmetry of the pyramids at Giza and the unending rhythm of the tides. These are just some of the patterns that the mathematician crystallizes into abstract ideas which we call mathematics. We have a nice program for you today, consisting of talks, a panel discussion and games in the afternoon. I hope that you will enjoy the day with us and you will leave with a renewed appreciation and love for mathematics. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, Nick Messer Schmidt and Ider Kikianti, for putting this day together. Thank you. We thank Professor van der Walt for his kind message. Our first lecture is by Professor Jacek Banaziak. Professor Banaziak is the BST NRF Sarchi Chair in Mathematical Models and Methods in Biosciences and Bioengineering. In 2012, he received the South African Mathematical Society Award for Research Distinction, and in 2013, the Cross of Merit of the Republic of Poland. He has authored or co-authored five research monographs and more than 100 peer-reviewed research papers. Professor Banaziak will speak on applied mathematics, past, present, and future. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, giving this talk. Uh, I wonder, uh, the main point here is just to discuss whether there is anything like applied or pure mathematics. Uh, if you think about, for example, this picture, it is from Sistine Chapel in the Vatican City, uh, painted by Michelangelo. It's a beautiful piece of work, but if you realize that it was commissioned by the Pope Julius II to enhance the power of the church. And it currently pulls an annual income of 80 million euros per year for the Vatican City. It is still pure or applied. A similar question we can ask about mathematics. Uh, for example, if we consider an equation for eigenvalues and eigenvector uh, for a matrix, there is a beautiful result called uh, Perron-Frobenius theorem, which uh, relates the sign of uh, entries of the matrix A with the existence of particular uh, solutions to this equation. Uh, so if uh, coefficients, if entries, the entries are non-negative, then there exists always a real and non-negative eigenvalue bigger than any other uh, eigenvalue in the magnitude, and there is a non-negative eigenvector corresponding to uh, this eigenvalue. Uh, it's about 100 years old theorem, uh, beautiful linear algebra, but now if in particular A is a matrix describing links between websites of the internet, then E gives page ranking in Google. And this is called sometimes 25 billion dollar eigenvector, because this is the current value of Google. So is it applied or pure mathematics? So possibly it is better to talk in general about mathematical sciences. Uh, mathematical sciences aim to understand the world by performing symbolic reasoning and computations on abstract structures. Uh, that is, we try to discover and understand relations among these abstract structures, to capture certain features of the world by such abstract structures through mathematical modeling, analyze them and use for computations and then to interpret them to make predictions about the world. Also, we use abstract arguments and structures to make inferences about the world from the data. A crucial part in the whole process is how we connect our reasoning gear to the external world. And thus, the concept of mathematical modeling is central 
to any application of mathematics. However, it is quite often a mistake made by quite often mathematicians. Modeling is not mathematics. So we cannot say that modeling is bad mathematics. In modeling, it is, not, it is impossible to prove that the model is correct. Uh, we can, in some sense, present uh, graphically uh, the structure of mathematical sciences, at least as I see it. So we start with uh, nature, natural nature, society, or engineering, and uh, we try to understand certain aspects here by building a mathematical model. If we build a mathematical model, then we analyze and produce some results, for example, by computer simulations or by finding exact solutions. In some sense, here there is a split between something which we could call more pure and more applied approach to uh, mathematical sciences. If you are interested only in the model and in the results, then you simply go back, compare your results with experimental data. If they are if they agree, then if they agree, then uh, uh, you are satisfied with your model. Sorry. Uh, uh, if not, you devise your model and do the cycle once again. On the other hand, if you are of more theoretical persuasion, uh, then you can, uh, having a model, you can actually think about generalizations and abstract structures presented. Uh, in the model and do some work on these abstract structures. And here we, you enter into the realm of pure mathematics. And in some sense, you can go around here by developing further abstractions and finding uh, deeper uh, relations between these structures and so on. But quite often, it turns out, it happens that uh, the structures which you devise, sorry, which you devise in pure mathematics, feedback and describe real phenomena or processes in, in the society. It is uh, in some sense captured very nicely by this citation, uh, we are of this world and nothing comes entirely from within ourselves without, without influence of the, in, the external world. Uh, sorry. Mm. Okay. Of course, when I said that uh, you cannot prove that the model is correct, it doesn't mean that uh, you cannot somehow classify models. They are good and bad models. And one of the main uh, features of a good model is that a good model has predictive powers. Uh, that is, a model based on variable observations give, gives correct answers in many other cases. For example, Newton discovered his mechanics, his calculus, without knowing that there is a planet called Neptune. And Neptune was actually discovered physically by pointing telescopes to the precisely the point indicated by calculations on the done on the basis of Newton mechanics. Similarly, for example, general theory of, theory of relativity predicted light deflection and gravitational waves. Dirac equations predicted existence of positrons. Standard theory of elementary particles predicted the existence of W and Z bosons. Higgs boson uh, discovered quite recently gluons and other and some quarks. So there are models which are built for to explain a particular set of data, but they have actually a bigger life in some sense. Now, the question is, uh, is mathematical modeling possible at all? So how can we reasonably sure that models are not just educated guesses? That is, that our abstract con constructs, uh, constructs of our mind, have anything to do with reality? Probably the best, in my opinion, quotation uh, about this comes from quite unlikely source, uh, namely Donald Rumsfeld, who was uh, quite infamous uh, Secretary of State under uh, George W. Bush. And he said, they are known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. They are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. And these are the things we don't know 
we don't know. And in some sense, this is precisely the situation we face, we face with uh, modeling of the real world. Uh, the discussion about the relation between mathematics and reality has continued over centuries, from Plato and Pythagoras through Kant to Frege and Russell. It hasn't been settled yet. Uh, so while there is no question that the external world has inspired mathematics, at least at its in initial stage, an open question is whether analysis done on mathematical models can say anything about the world. So if we go back to my little picture, then the debate actually is about these two arrows. So whether analyzing model, we can say something about the na nature, about if we actually construct some abstract uh, structures in pure mathematics, whether there is any possibility that these abstract structures can be found in nature. Well, possibly if early humans had been all mathematicians, the wheel would not have been invented. After all, first usable wheels were far from being perfect circles. So a good mathematician would stop until the constructed wheel is precisely a perfect circles. Fortunately, there must have been a few engineers among early people, uh, and these people thought as follows. I remember that all models are wrong. And the practical question is how long do they have to be not to be useful? So possibly we'll never know whether our mathematical tools just scratch the surface or reach deeper and deeper into the real world. We should be satisfied that we keep building a coherent and expanding body of knowledge, which does not contradict too much the surrounding world. This process is very well illustrated by, for instance, the realization that there are dark matter and dark energy. While at present we don't know what they are, we moved them from the category of unknown unknowns to the category of known unknowns. So we, will, we may never know the ultimate truth. But, continu but by continually enlarging the set of uh, known knowns and the set of known unknowns, we strive. I think we strive in the right direction. So, summarizing. At worst, mathematics is allow, uh, a language allowing for migration of concepts from field to field. At best, the concepts of mathematics are true reflection of the laws of the universe. This is the reason why mathematical sciences have been de developed by any civilization existing on Earth. And in its current state, it is a common heritage of the whole mankind. What we have at our disposal today is an interwoven effect of work of many generations in all corners of the globe. And thus, mathematics is universal in the sense that it is independent of geographical location, religion, politics, and its timeless. So let us have a short tour into the past and talk about some historical developments of mathematics. Uh, though, uh, Civilizations are younger, uh, are older, I'm sorry, are older than, uh, than uh, our departure point. We start with, with uh, the civilizations around 2000 uh, years BC, uh, with, for, for which we have a, a quite good uh, written and material records. Essentially, at the same time, uh, there were three big centers of civilization, uh, one in the so-called Golden Crescent in the Middle East, one in Indus Valley, and one in uh, China. Uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the best written records we have are from, from the uh, civilizations, which are in Mesopotamia, so it will these were Assyrians, Babylonians, Akkadians, and so on. Uh, they were probably a little bit more advanced than Egyptians in this time. Uh, their mathematical notation was positional, but sexagesimal. They used no zero, though they had actually a concept of uh, empty space in calculations, but it was not used as a number. They used quite a lot of uh, 
fractions, not, so not all fractions were admitted. Uh, they could extract square roots, they could solve linear systems, uh, they work with Pythagorean triples, uh, they solved cubic equations with the help of tables, they studied circular uh, measurements, uh, though their geomet geometry was sometimes uh, incorrect. Uh, as you can see, uh, they, they didn't have the concept of, of uh, proof, uh, so their mathematics could be divided as mathematics for long or all, for almost hist all history can be divided into utilitarian mathematics uh, related to trade, to measurements of uh, land and so on, and recreational mathematics, something which we can call now pure mathematics. Uh, now come the Greeks. The Greeks possibly developed the concept of uh, rigorous mathematical proof. Uh, There's a number of towering fig figures in, in uh, Greek mathematics. I have chosen two names, uh, Pythagoras, uh, not maybe because of his mathematical achievements, which are uh, arguable, let us say, but because of his uh, beliefs, which fits into our dis earlier discussion about the relation of mathematics and uh, real world, namely uh, following Plato, Pythagoras believed that nature is geometric, that everything essentially is built on the basis of so-called five platonic solids. And studying geometry, one studies nature. Uh, one of the greatest minds of antiquity and probably maybe of the whole human history was Archimedes, who was uh, really the uh, prototype of, let us say, applied mathematics, good, very good applied mathematician. He was, he was an engineer, a military scientist, physicist, and pure mathematician in one. Uh, what I would like to try to point out is that uh, Archimedes calculated the value of pi uh, using uh, the inscribed and circumscribed poly, uh, polygons. And what is remarkable about, about his calculation is that he was able actually to find lower and upper approximation of pi, which means that he was able to calculate the error of this approximation. And this type of argument has been absent in uh, mathematics for at least two millennia and in many applied departments of uh, currently of modern world, the concept that an approximation should come with an error estimate is rather absent. It was quite well summarized by very good mathematician Friedrich. Applied mathematics consists in solving exact problems approximately, but approximate this problem exactly. A great era of so the Middle East and Greek mathematics came to an end with uh, the advances of the Roman Empire and subsequent collapse of the Roman Empire, and the center of intellectual world moved to the East. Uh, in China, uh, there were a number of, of prominent mathematicians, again, we just scratched the surface by uh, pointing to Yu Hui, uh, who calculated a very good approximation for pi. Also, he proved independently uh, Pythagoras theorem, as you can see uh, on this on this picture. Uh, possibly, he used negative numbers before Indians did. Uh, but definitely, the further documented use of negative numbers. Sorry, uh, at the same more or less at the same time, uh, on the other side of the globe, there was another great civilization or set of civilizations, uh, namely Mayans, who also developed a very sophisticated mathematics. Uh, he, they knew zero and they used positional uh, notation using zero as a number. So they were able to calculate, uh, to calculate uh, positions of astronomical uh, bodies with amazing accuracy. Uh, they were doing this mostly for uh, religious purposes, so in some sense, this was an applied mathematics. Uh, now we move back to India, uh, where uh, one of the greatest names was probably Brahmagupta, who was the first to uh, present uh, formal 
uh, rules for calculations with zero. He used negative numbers. Uh, it was a very in the very proximity of India, uh, there appeared actually another big civilization uh, based on, on Islamic Muslim conquest of the Arabic Peninsula. And in uh, by the end of the first millennium, probably something like the Oxford University or the uh, Institute of, for Advanced Studies was in Baghdad. Uh, Caliph Al Rashid, Harun Al Rashid, created an uh, amazing library. Uh, he started the translation movement, and scholars from all over the world were going to Baghdad. They were translating Greek uh, treatises, Greek uh, work, and they developed amazing, amazing science. Uh, one of the well most known uh, representatives of this movement was Muhammad uh, Al Khwarizmi, who is uh, associated with the uh, idea of algorithm. Indeed, he actually uh, presented a number of algebraic operations in the forms in the form of algorithms. Uh, this great period of uh, Baghdad, of uh, Middle East uh, science, lasted uh, for about 400 years. Uh, the fall, as usual, was uh, had multiple causes. One was Conflict, very disconflict between uh, relatively open minded scientists and conservative ulems, but also uh, the invasion of Chinggis Khan completely destroyed the civilization. Uh, Mongols raised Baghdad to the ground. And so, one of the last uh, representatives of this school was uh, Al Tusi, uh, who, as you can see, is credited, for example, with. Uh, developing the law of uh, science. Uh, he was a great critic of Ptolemaic uh, system of the world and probably influenced Copernicus. Uh, he's a good example of uh, how uh, mathematics can be applied for saving uh, one's life. He was, uh, when after the fall of Baghdad, he was um, for some time employed by the Nizari state, better known as assassins and he were to moving from castle to castle. But eventually, castles were captured by Mongols, and uh, Al-Tusi himself was captured by Kulunu Khan, a Mongol. But instead of being executed, he convinced uh, the Khan uh, to build him an astronomical observatory to improve astronomical observations and therefore to make better astrological predictions. So, Astronomy, which is supposed to be a very pure science, actually was a part of applied science applied to astrology. Moving back to India, one of the greatest minds, uh, Mahava, uh, was credited with first work with infinite series. He calculated pi uh, using this particular series here uh, with accuracy of up to 11 digits. And so he essentially could be thought of the inventor of calculus. Everything's move, everything moves around, and, and uh, now we go back to Europe. Europe for something like a thousand years was really a backwater of civilization. Uh, decimal, or so-called Hindu, uh, Arabic uh, numbers were introduced in Europe only in 12th centuries by uh, Leonardo of Pisa called Fibonacci. Uh, but uh, this decimal notation took quite a lot of time to uh, be accepted in Europe. For example, as, uh, recent, well, as, recent, as recently as in the uh, 13th century, uh, decimal Hindu, uh, Hindu uh, Indian numerals were banned in Florence, uh, using them was illegal. But uh, Europe developed, especially Italy, developed very fast. And then we fast, fast forward to the beginning of the 16th century. Uh, the person whom uh, you see here is Girolamo Cardano. 
Uh, it's actually quite interesting uh, case. Uh, he was really the inventor of complex numbers, uh, but uh, he didn't believe in them being really useful. Uh, on the other hand, most people know his name from uh, solving cubic equations, so the Cardano's formula or formulae for solving cubic equations. Uh, just to understand uh, this, it's nice maybe to have a look at uh, how mathematics was done in Italy in those days. Uh, typically, uh, Italians were famous dualists, and one of the uh, types of dual were uh, mathematical duals. So if you had a nice result, you can challenge another mathematician and uh, at the public contest, actually shows that this other person is completely and utterly stupid. Uh, so one of the popular topics in those days were cubic equations. Uh, but uh, mathematicians by the name of Del Ferro knew how to solve one type of these equations, but he kept it secret and revealed this to uh, his student Fior on the dead. Now Fior was a young uh, person and desperately uh, wanted some recognition, so he challenged another mathematician for a public contest, how to solve cubic equations, knowing the result of Del Ferro. Uh, Tartaglia, was, uh, Tartaglia knew about another type of cubic equations, but just a day before the contest, he found a general way of solving cubics. So he completely trashed Fior. Now Cardano learned about this, and he tried to bribe Tartaglia to reveal the method. Eventually succeeded, on the condition of uh, him, Cardano, not reveal, uh, revealing the method. But Cardano with Ferrari managed to use this method to solve another type of equation, quartics, and learned that it was Del Ferro who was the first to solve cubics. Uh, so Cardano published the results, calling the result the Del Ferro's method, which incensed, of course, Tart Tartaglia. And Tartaglia challenged Ferrari, but during the contest, he realized that he doesn't stand a chance and threw a towel and left in the contest side. So for some reason, uh, the name of Cardano is associated with cubic equations, but he really was not the person who found the way of solving them. Uh, I will short trip about uh, in a short sort of survey of the history of uh, mathematics and applied mathematics will be sort of like ended with the invention of calculus, which probably is the basis of uh, most applied mathematics done in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, two people uh, are credited with uh, invention of calculus, Isaac Newton and Englishman and Gottfried Leibniz, German, whatever it meant in those days. Unfortunately, uh, soon after, uh, by the end of the 17th century, a conflict erupted between them and between their supporters, who was really the first one. Uh, it is a very good example of how conflicts in, in science and in mathematics actually can be detrimental to both sides of the conflict. This conflict, on one hand, titled the development of British analysis, because Newton's notation was completely useless. So the, on the left hand side here you have how Newton denoted derivatives and integrals. You can imagine how complicated it would be actually to do partial uh, derivatives or multiple integrals. <clears throat> on the other hand, actually the notation which we know now was adapted in, in uh, Britain only in 1840, if I remember correctly. Uh, but on the other hand, thanks to the well-known British expertise in black PR, uh, Leibniz's achievements were sent into obscurity for many years. He has been recognized as a one of the creators of calculus only by the end of the 19th century. So, in the 20th century, the center moved to the USA. It is not because the Americans were more clever uh, than Europeans or Chinese, but because they devised much more clever policies that allowed gifted students and young researchers to come to the USA to study and work there, and in exchange to build the American power. 
Currently, the center seems to move again to the east, where India and China, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, beat the Western countries in their own game. Mathematics doesn't have borders, and only those who are able and willing to play the global game can become global winners. After all, as Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. What matters is that it catches mice. So let us move to uh, mathematical challenges now. Uh, in early 20th century, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, uh, Hilbert, uh, listed 23 so-called Hilbert problems. As you can see, they are a mixture of pure and applied, let us say, mathematics problems. Uh, one was the continuum hypothesis, uh, proving uh, that the axioms of arithmetic are consistent, mathematical treatment of the axioms of physics, the Riemann hypothesis, uh, the questions related to uh, variational problems, which are the rate of the day in those days. So are the solutions of regular problems in calculus of variations always necessarily analytic? And do all variational, variational problems with certain boundary conditions have solutions? Uh, so as I said, Hilbert himself did fundamental work in both mathematics and applied mathematics, as we may say. And so his problems are a mix of pure and applied questions. Uh, if we fast forward, almost 100 years, we have another set of problems, which again are a mixture of pure and applied questions. There are so-called Clay Institute Millennium problems, they were formulated about 20 years ago, as one can guess. Uh, and one of these problems has been already solved. This, uh, sol uh, this so-called Poincare conjectures, so essentially uh, mm, some the result that uh, general uh, three-dimensional manifolds are more or less the same as, as spheres. Uh, great unsolved problems are, for example, P versus NP. So the question is whether uh, for all problems for which an algorithm can verify a given solution quickly, an algorithm can also find the solution at the same time, more or less. Uh, there are some... Uh, Purely mathematical questions, I will not go into details. Riemann hypothesis is still an open problem. Uh, there are questions related to uh, physics. Uh, Nagelstock's equations, uh, one of the greatest topics in partial differential equations is the existence of solutions of the Nagelstock's equations describing the fluid flow. Uh, and also, this is in some sense an upshot of, I think, 10th uh, Hilbert's problem. And the sign of the times is that uh, unlike the Hilbert problems, where the primary award was the admiration of Hilbert in particular and mathematicians in general, uh, each millennium prize includes a million dollar bounty. So that's a big award for solving one of these problems. Uh, can we address any of these problems in the current academic landscape? This is something which I call the fallacy of immediate returns, which has plagued uh, universities all over the world recently. Mathematics doesn't give immediate returns. We talked a little bit about Cardano, complex numbers invented in 1545, considered to be rather useless, but became indispensable in mathematics in the 19th century, in physics, quantum mechanics, engineering, fast Fourier transform in the 20th century. Uh, think about another very abstract concept, quaternions. They are hyper-complex numbers developed out of sheer curiosity by Hamilton as an extension of complex numbers. Now are used in video games and in tracking satellites. A classical example, prime numbers and algebraic number theory, once considered to be the pinnacle of pure mathematics, now underpins the internet banking and commerce. Uh, I can give you, I don't know whether this is... Uh, where visible, we can uh, enlarge the screen. Uh, there is some patents, US patents, involving pure mathematics. For example, elliptic curves are involved in the patent, which allows a user to choose his own or her own uh, elliptic curve 
for uh, encrypting uh, personal data. Uh, complex numbers, applic certain applications of complex numbers to fast Fourier transform has been patented. The concept of minimal surface, for example, is uh, patented as a way to uh, as, let us say, critical scaffold for regeneration of human bone and organ tissues, and so on. So uh, you can see that pure mathematics has really an applied, a very applied flavor in it. So sometime uh, at the beginning of, of the talk, I showed you a slide uh, about applications uh, of linear algebra in multi-billion dollar uh, internet in the industry. Uh, at the end here, I would like actually to quickly show you uh, how such algorithms uh, are created. It is not exactly the Google uh, algorithm, but something very similar. And uh, the idea behind uh, the search engines is ranking of the results. So in general, ranking is very important uh, in uh, internet and also in many other uh, fields of, of life. Uh, so we describe one of the simplest algorithms. Uh, his his uh, his idea is to determine so-called hubs and authorities in the network. Authorities are web pages with many links to them and from which we can get to many authorities. And hubs are pages that link to many authorities. Uh, you can immediately see, so we, uh, in, 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 if we do internet search, we would like, of course, the authorities to be at the top of the search results. However, determining an authority involves a circular argument. To determine whether something is an authority or not, we must know all authorities beforehand, okay? Because authorities are determined by authorities. So it seems to be an unsolvable problem, but fortunately mathematics uh, can do things like that. So uh, let us suppose that we have, we think about the um, uh, internet and we have, uh, we think about all pages on the internet and uh, we can assign a non-negative authority value, let us say XJ and the hub value to each page I. Now, an important concept here is uh, so-called adjacency matrix. So these are matrices telling us, uh, so this is a big matrix, and uh, the uh, coefficient Aij tells us that there is a link, if this uh, coefficient is one, uh, there is a link from page number j to page number i. And mathematical operation called transposition uh, reverses the order of indices and then in this uh, so 80 tells us that uh, there is a link to page j from page i so how the uh, algorithm works so let us suppose that we have uh, given some values for authorities so let us suppose that at random we assign certain values to the authorities, uh, some authority value and some hub value to all pages. And now uh, we evaluate an improvement, an next iteration here. So for example, the new value of xi, k, the value of xk plus one will be the sum of all values of hubs which refer to this page. So the better value of the hub, the greater gain in the authority value of the page. And a similar thing is done with hubs and authorities. So we improve the value of the authority, sorry, of the hub, uh, page if many authorities are referred to by this particular page. Okay? So clearly, if we at random assigned the values xk and yk 
to all pages, then this operation will improve the uh, will improve the uh, ranking in the sense that uh, these values x i k plus one and y i k plus one give a better reflection of whether something is a good authority or a good hub. So if we are satisfied with this operation, we can continue. So we can now use x i k plus one and y i k plus one as our new authority and hub value and do the same and do, do the same and proceed iterate now the question is how do we know that this procedure will eat us to a unique right ranking and the answer is in linear algebra and the parallel frobenius theorem the matrices this matrix is aat and uh, the matrix aat has, always has non-negative entries and in particular, if uh, AAT is irreducible, then that is, if one can connect from any page to any other, then there is a unique eigenvalue of the largest magnitude, and it, it's real and positive, and the associated eigenvector has positive entries. That is, it can be proved that the iterations described in the previous, uh, on the previous page always converge to solutions of this two equations. So they are eigenvectors of matrices AAT and ATA with corresponding eigenvalues. And essentially, an algorithm, a procedure to calculate, quickly calculate these eigenvectors and eigenvalues is behind any ranking system and in particular uh, is the system used by Google, the so-called page rank algorithm. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Benasiak, for that inspiring lecture. Any questions for uh, Professor Benasiak may be posted to the link in the description. We hope to address some of your questions uh, during the live panel discussion a little bit later. Do note, due to our time constraints, we may not be able to get to all of the questions that we receive. We continue our program this morning with a lecture by Professor James Raftery. Professor Raftery is an internationally renowned mathematician whose research focuses on algebra, logic, and the interface between them. He won the South African, uh, the South African Mathematical Society Award for Research Distinction in 2014 and has published more than 60 peer-reviewed journal articles. Professor Raftery will speak on logic and mathematical discovery. Right, so in this talk, I'll present the statements of three theorems, each of which is a striking result in its own right. And although I won't give their proofs, I'll say something about how they came to be discovered. In each case, findings or investigations from mathematical logic played a role in the discovery, although that is not visible in the statements of the theorems themselves. They are not statements about logic. So what I'm doing here is using mathematical logic as an exemplar of pure mathematical research while also highlighting its capacity to illuminate other parts of mathematics. So I said there would be three theorems. Let me now motivate theorem one. Back in the 1600s, Fermat conjectured that the number two to the two to the n plus one would be prime for all positive integers n. And that is indeed true when n is one or two or three or four but it turned out to be false when n is five, as was not easily verifiable back in the 1600s. Anyway, experiments like this led mathematicians to feel pessimistic about the existence of an elementary formula that would generate the prime numbers. That is a vague statement. What do we mean, for instance, by an elementary formula? Presumably two to the two to the n plus one would be an example. And what do we mean by generate? Presumably, we mean that we want the formula to produce nothing but prime numbers, but would we want a formula that perhaps generates all the prime numbers? Anyway, the negative expectation, the pessimistic expectation, turned out to be incorrect in the following sense, and this is theorem one, which was proved in 1970. 
Um, the final piece in the puzzle was put in by Yuri Matyasevich in 1970, 10 years after the contributions of the other people on whose work he built, Julia Robinson, Martin Davis, and Hilary Putnam. And the result says that there is a polynomial P in several variables, x1 to xn, with integer coefficients, a so whole number coefficients, such that if we compute the values of this polynomial P at all possible non-negative integers, a1 to a n in the roles of x1 to xn, thereby getting a lot of answers, if we discard the negative answers, we are left with exactly the positive primes. So this is a procedure which generates all the prime numbers, and it appears to be elementary because it is given by a polynomial with integer coefficients, even if there are several variables. So in, in that way, it refutes the negative or pessimistic expectation about elementary formulas that produce the prime numbers. And the polynomial P in the theorem is not unique, neither is the number of variables that it involves. And on the next slide, I will exhibit one such polynomial that does this work. So it's a polynomial in 26 variables. And since there are 26 letters of the alphabet, I'll label the variables as A, B up to Z. And the value of P at A, B up to Z is given by this formula on the right of the equals sign which looks quite involved inevitably since there are 26 variables. But in fact, it is got from the variables by doing nothing other than adding, subtracting, and multiplying, including multiplying by coefficients. But the coefficients are always whole numbers like the 16 that you can see. So in that sense, it is an elementary formula, even if long to write down. And when I say that it does the job uh, described in theorem one, I remind you that that means that if you take all possible uh, sequences of 26 non-negative integers and substitute them for a, b to z in the expression on the right-hand side, and then discard the negative answers that you get, the remaining answers that you have are exactly the positive primes. So this was a surprising outcome given the expectation about elementary formulas. Now, I said that I won't prove this result, but I'll say something about the discovery process. And I presented it to you as a theorem about primes. In a way, that was misleading because it's more general. It is a theorem about all so-called recursive functions. I'm not going to give the precise general definition of a recursive function, but it is exemplified by the simple-minded function that we would use if we wanted to list all the positive primes. Uh, that function f, from n to n simply says that the first prime number, the first positive prime is two. So let us set f of one equal to two. And if we recursively assume that we have already computed the first n positive primes called f1 to fn, we will define the n plus first positive prime to be the smallest positive integer not divisible by any of the primes f1 to fn. And we call that answer fn plus one. This is clearly an accurate way to list the, the positive primes. Um, and it is recursive in the colloquial sense that at each step, let us say at the n plus first step, the value of the function f at n plus one is determined mechanically from the values that we already computed for the previous n's, f of one up to f of n. That is a, a hallmark of recursive functions in general, although I'm not defining them precisely. And the theorem of Matyasevich was not in itself a theorem about prime numbers. That was a special case. It was a theorem about recursive functions. And it was also a surprise because it had been dubbed a, an unlikely conjecture before it was proved. And what Matyasevich did was to connect recursive functions in general with so-called Diophantine equations, which I will explain on the next slide. So what is the Diophantine equation? It is uh, an equation involving a polynomial with integer coefficients, p, say, and it can be in several variables. So for example, the last equation on the slide is a Diophantine equation, integer coefficients three minus four and six, and in this case, three variables, x1, x2, and x3. When uh, dealing with a Diophantine equation, we may be interested in whether it has any integer solutions. That is to say, whole numbers 
x1, x2, x3, etc., which when substituted into the equation make the equation true. And the interest in integer solutions or whole number solutions is natural because there are problems in which a variable might, for instance, stand for the number of nodes needed in a, con in a communications network. And there it might make no sense at all to talk about half a node or three quarters of a node. One wants whole numbers only in order that the solution be useful. And the background to this is Hilbert's 10th problem, which was uh, posed in 1900 by David Hilbert uh, as part of 23 problems, 23 famous problems that ended up, Hilbert's 23 problems ended up uh, largely setting the research agenda for the 20th century in mathematics. And the 10th problem asked for an algorithm that's a purely mechanical procedure that would reliably test arbitrary Diophantine equations like one for the possession of integer solutions. Uh, he didn't ask that the algorithm should find the integer solutions, only that it should detect their existence. And it turns out to make no difference whether we phrase Hilbert's 10th problem in terms of integer solutions, as I've done, or positive integer solutions. Before the problem was settled, it was already known that it would make no difference to the answer whether we wrote integer solutions or positive integer solutions in the statement of the problem. So that was the background. And Matyasevich's contribution in 1970 was to show that every recursive function, uh, f say, with a finite number of variables, in this case I've written a k for the number of variables, every recursive function is diophantine. I'll explain that in a moment. But bear in mind here that the simple-minded prime generating function f that we had two slides back is an example of a recursive function. So it is diophantine in the same sense that I'm explaining here. It means that the recursive function is simulated by a polynomial. To each recursive function f, we can associate a polynomial p in several variables. Variables than uh, the recursive function f has, so more than k variables. The polynomial will have integer coefficients and its relation to the original recursive function is as follows. Whenever we take a computation for the original function, say we plug in a1 to ak for the variables of f and get an answer b, that is equivalent to the Diophantine equation p equals zero becoming true when some numbers are substituted for its last n variables. So in P, the first K plus one variables are taken up by the numbers that were used on the previous line in the computation of a value for F, but the last N variables of P were left unassigned until we say that they make P equals zero true for some values of the C's. In other words, what one is saying is that the Diophantine equation P equals zero has a solution Z1 to Zn in the positive integers. So in that way, Matthias Sevich correlates with every recursive function, a Diophantine equation. And this, as I say, was a surprising outcome. The role of mathematical logic was that by 1936, uh, logic had connected the notion of a recursive function with the intuitive notion of an algorithm, which was then made precise in the form of Turing machines. And because of this, what Matyasevich's theorem implied was that Hilbert's problem, Hilbert's 10th problem, could be reduced to a problem that had already been solved by Alan Turing in 1936, the so-called halting problem. And putting all of that together, the answer to Hilbert's 10th problem in 1970, proved by Matyasevich, building on the work of the three other people I mentioned, the answer was that Hilbert's 10th problem is unsolvable in the sense that no algorithm exists which reliably tests arbitrary Diophantine equations for the possession of integer solutions. And the prime generating polynomials, such as the one on, in 26 variables that I showed you, were a positive outcome of this otherwise negative result. The idea was that the, the simple-minded prime generating function, which was not a polynomial, that was a recursive function. Matyasevich had correlated with each recursive function a Diophantine equation and thereby a polynomial, and that is how the prime generating polynomials emerged. So the role of logic here was in the original analysis of the intuitive concept of an algorithm and the way that it was made precise 
in the form of Turing machines and then linked up with recursive functions. Work on Hilbert's 10th problem is not over because there's a variant of it that is still an open problem. That's Hilbert's 10th problem for the rationals. And it asks whether there is an algorithm that tests arbitrary Diophantine equations for the possession now not of integer solutions, but of rational number solutions. So that's an open problem on which a lot of work has been done and work is still being done. And in this sense, Hilbert's 10th problem is still alive. So that concludes what I wanted to say about theorem one, and I shall now motivate theorem two. And I'll do so by reminding you of a very simple property of finite sets. If you have a finite set A, for example, on the slide, I've got one with four elements, and you consider a function from A to itself. So I've drawn A again. If that function is one to one, then it will be onto, and this is because of the finiteness of A. Just to illustrate that in the picture, the function must send every element of the A on the left to some element of A on the right. So the top element of A must go to some element of A on the right. For example, it might go to the bottom element of A on the right. Now, if I want the function to be one to one, when I send the other elements of A to values on the right, I must never send two different elements to the same element. So the second element must not go to the bottom element. It must go to some other element. It might go to itself, for instance. Similarly, the third element on the left must not go to the two elements that have already been used on the right. It might again go to itself. And if that's the case, then the last element on the left has no choice but to go to the only rem remaining element on the right if the function is to be one to one. So this particular function is one to one. It never sent two distinct elements to the same element. And because four elements were sent and there were only four elements on the right hand side to start out with, it is inevitable that four elements, that all four elements on the right are used up. The function is then onto in the sense that every dot on the right has a red arrowhead next to it. It is f of something from the domain. And this always happens when you send a finite set to itself with a one-to-one -one function. It is then forced to be onto as well. This, however, is false for infinite sets A, as the simple example of the infinite set of natural numbers shows. If you take, for instance, the doubling function from n to n, which sends every natural number to twice that number, as you can see in the picture from the red arrows, or from common sense, no two elements are sent to the same element, so the function is one to one, but it is not on two because not every element from the n on the right turns up with a red arrowhead next to it. The odd numbers are not in the range of this doubling function. So because n was infinite, this can happen. A one to one function from n to n need not be on. Now in theorem two, I will be talking about a particular infinite set and certain but not all one-to-one -one functions from that set to itself. And by restricting my attention to particular functions, we will get that those functions when one-to-one -one are onto. And this will involve the complex numbers. So C is the set of complex numbers A plus B I, where A and B are real numbers and I is the square root of minus one. So if I write C2, I mean the set of all ordered pairs of complex numbers, and more generally, C to the n is the set of n tuples of complex numbers. And just as we talked about polynomials with integer coefficients in theorem one, we can now talk about polynomial functions from C2 to C. Uh, just as before, these will be functions of two variables where the answer is given like any polynomial as a sum of multiples of products of powers of the two variables z and w. But the multiples, the coefficients in red on the right-hand side, which here are 1, 6i, minus pi, 1 plus 5i, and minus root 2, those are allowed to be any complex numbers, including, of course, real numbers, but complex numbers are also allowed. So that is what we mean by a polynomial function from C2 to C. If we then talk about a polynomial function from C2 to C2, it is defined in the same way, except that the answer is not one complex number, but an ordered pair of complex numbers, where in each of the two coordinates, the answer is given by a polynomial function in the variables z and w. 
So a polynomial function from C2 to C2 is given by two polynomial functions from C2 to C. And of course, we can go beyond the power two to polynomial functions from C to the N to C to the N, and each of them will be determined by N particular polynomial functions from C to the N to C, which jointly determine how the big polynomial function F from C to the N to C to the N will act on an arbitrary N uh, a sequence of n complex numbers z1 to zn. So those are polynomial functions from c to the n uh, to c to the n. And theorem two is about them. It was proved by James Axe in 1968. So consider an arbitrary polynomial function f from c to the n to c to the n. And Axe's theorem says that if this f is one to one, then it is onto. Now, c to the n is certainly not finite. It is not only infinite, but uncountably infinite. So something is going on here that goes beyond our example of finite sets and one-to-one -one functions between them being onto. And of course, what's making the difference here is that f is not an arbitrary function, but a polynomial function. It is not obvious, however, that restricting to polynomial functions should make that difference. So although I'm not going to prove the theorem, let me say something about the tools that are needed prove it. Axe's original proof used results from mathematical logic, and they concern structures for so-called first-order languages. Now here, the structure that concerns us is the complex numbers, but equipped with the operations of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. So the first-order language that we will be talking about, apart from having logical particles in it, will also have the symbols for addition, subtraction, and multiplication in it, and nothing else. And if we want to say, for instance, that this particular polynomial function from C2 to C2 is one to one, so this is just an example on the slide, we can express it as something that is almost a first order sentence in the language of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. How would we say that G is one to one? We would need to take, consider two ordered pairs, ZW and Z1W1, of complex numbers. And we want to say that um, G doesn't send ZW to the same answer as it sent, sends Z1W1, unless ZW is the same pair as Z1W1. Or equivalently, I can say that if G sends pair ZW to the same thing that it sends pair Z1W, one, two, then that can only be because the two pairs were the same. Now, how would I say that? I have to say that GZW is equal to GZ1W1, and that is a statement about two coordinates. So the red equations that I've just put up deal with the first and the second coordinate respectively, and together they say that G sends ZW and Z1W1 to the same pair. And we wanted to say that if that happens, then ZW and Z1W1 were themselves the same pair, which is a first coordinate statement and a second coordinate statement to equations Z is Z1 and W is W1. So there I have expressed that G is one to one. <clears throat> Similarly, I can express the fact that G is on to by saying that whenever you take two complex numbers U and V, in other words, a pair UV, then it will be G of something. G of some pair ZW. So there will exist a Z and a W complex numbers such that G of ZW is UV. And again, that's a statement involving two coordinates. And the first and second red equations tell us in, in the first and second coordinates respectively that G of ZW is UV. So we can express G being onto in this way. Now these uh, expressions in quotation marks are almost first order sentences in the language of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. The reason why they're not exactly that is that they also involve special numbers like 1, 5, i, 1, and minus 1. But we can get rid of those by freezing the degree type of the polynomial. So the type of uh, GZW in the middle of the slide was something Z squared plus something ZW, something W cubed Z plus something where I'm now using letters A, B, C, D to stand for those uh, somethings, which were originally 1, 5i, 1, and minus 1. 
I want to forget the original values of those numbers, just use variables A, B, C, D to stand for those coefficients. That's what I mean by freezing the degree type of G. And then if we do that, we can express as a genuine first order sentence involving only addition, subtraction, and multiplication, the claim that any one-to-one -one polynomial function from C2 to itself of the same degree type of G is onto. And this would be a statement that says, for all of the values of the coefficients, A, B, C, D, so those were originally one, uh, five I, one, and minus one, but I want to not stipulate what they are for any values of the coefficients. We have an if then statement, if G is one to one, then G is onto. And how do I say G is one to one? Exactly as I said it on the previous slide, but with A, B, C, D taking over the roles of one, five I, one, and minus one. Likewise, I say that G is onto exactly as I did on the previous slide, but with the letters A, B, C, and D taking over the roles of one, five I, one, and minus one. Now, the point here is I've got rid of those particular numbers and this now is a genuine first order sentence in the language of addition subtraction and multiplication which captures the fact that any one-to-one -one polynomial function from c2 to itself of the same degree type as g is onto so it's a first order property because it involves only uh, variables no no longer special numbers the symbols for addition, subtraction, and multiplication, logical particles, like and and if then, but also, and this is the important thing about being first order, where quantifiers occur, and by that I mean where we write for all x or there exists x, it is understood that the x being referred to is an element of the structure, an element of C in this case, a complex number, rather than something more complicated like, for instance, a subset of the complex numbers or a function or a relation. If that's understood, then we speak of a first order property. And first order properties are important in mathematical logic. Uh, math mathematical logicians are preoccupied about the distinction between first order and more complex properties for reasons that will become apparent. In our example of Axis theorem, I dealt on the previous slide with one particular degree type for a polynomial, but it is clear that we could treat all other degree types in the same way. And if we do, we get an infinite sequence of genuine first order statements in the language of addition, subtraction, and multiplication, which together express the content of Axe's theorem, that every one-to-one -one polynomial function from C to the N to C to the N is onto no matter what finite number N is. All right, now, as it happens, the first order sentences that are true in the complex structure C with that language are exactly the ones that are true in all so-called algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. I'm not going to define that expression in red. What matters here about it is that one can write down defining axioms for algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero. And importantly, they are also first order sentences rather than more complicated ones. To them, we can add a standard bunch of purely logical axioms, which are also first order sentences and rules of inference. And altogether those postulates constitute what we call a first order formal theory. And this is important because there is a general theorem about first order formal theories that is not true of more uh, general theories. It is Gödel's completeness theorem proved in 1930. And it says that if you take a sentence A of a first order formal theory T, then a certain if then claim is correct. <clears throat> The if part says, if A is true in all the structures that obey the axioms of T, then there will be a formal proof of A in T, by which I mean a proof from the axioms and inference rules of T. This is a stricter notion of proof than the, uh, the ordinary rigorous but informal proofs that we normally perform in mathematics. A formal proof of A in T would be a finite sequence of statements ending with A, such that every statement in the sequence is either an axiom of T or the direct consequence of previous statements in the sequence by one of the stipulated inference rules of T. So that's the strict notion of a formal proof. Now you might wonder whether we learn anything from Gödel's completeness theorem. Suppose that we know one in the case of A and T. 
From it, we can deduce two, but do we re really learn anything from two that we didn't already know from one? So instead of merely knowing that A holds in all the structures that obey the axioms of P, how do we gain by knowing that there's a formal proof of A in P? The answer is that a formal proof has finite length. It comprises just N sentences for some particular natural number N. And that value n becomes a quantitative tool that can then be used in arguments about structures that satisfy the axioms of t and that would not have been available to us had we only known one. That is why Gödel's completeness theorem is useful. And in this case, knowing that quantitative tool n, that is the germ that leads to the proof of Axe's theorem. Uh, using that information, Axe was able to reduce the problem that he was solving to one about functions from finite sets to themselves. And that is a surprise since, as I said, c to the n is uncountably infinite. But nevertheless, using this logical tool of Gödel's completeness theorem, X reduces his problem to one that involves only one-to-one -one functions from finite sets to themselves, where we know that they will be onto, as in the example that I did at the beginning. So that was the idea behind um, the proof. And the contribution from mathematical logic came via Gödel's completeness theorem. So that is theorem two, and I will now motivate theorem three. So this is about rational functions, uh, rational functions of several real variables here. Now, not complex numbers, real numbers. So uh, rational function f of variables x1 to xn, which are intended to, to acquire values that are real numbers. It is given by a formula that is a polynomial divided by a polynomial in the same variables and also with real coefficients. So for example, here is one rational function, AXY, a polynomial in X and Y divided by another one. Here is a second rational function in X and Y, a third one and a fourth one. Now, so those define rational functions. If you happen to square formally each of those rational functions and then formally add up, simplify, taking a common denominator and canceling where appropriate. It turns out that you get a polynomial as the answer, polynomial in two variables with real coefficients, as opposed to a rational function. I don't need a, de a denominator in this answer anymore. It has disappeared because of cancellation. And it's clear that the polynomial on the right is a non-negative real polynomial function. It's non-negative because it is a sum of first four squares. That could never yield a negative answer. Now, another of Hilbert's problems, his 17th problem, deals with the reverse situation. So starting with where we ended with a non-negative real polynomial function, like the one at the end of the slide, Hilbert's 17th problem asks whether it is always possible to break it up as a sum of squares of rational functions. So that was Hilbert's 17th problem, and the answer turned out to be yes. And that was proved by Emil Artin in 1927, and it's the content of what I'm calling theorem three. So to recap, it says that if you have a polynomial in several variables with real coefficients, which is non-negative in the sense that you always get an answer greater than or equal to zero, when you substitute any real numbers for the variables, then that polynomial is a sum of squares of rational functions over the reals, by which I mean that there exist finitely many rational functions, f1 to fm, of the same number of variables with real coefficients, such that uh, for any real numbers a1 to an, the action of the polynomial p on a1 to an is the same as that of the sum of squares of the rational functions f1 to fm. So that's Artin's solution to Hilbert's 17th problem. Uh, and in 1927, no logic was, no mathematical logic was involved in obtaining the solution. Um, <clears throat> you might wonder in this statement whether we could improve the result by choosing, since p was a polynomial, choosing the f's to be polynomials as well, rather than merely rational functions, but it turns out that can't always be done. Let us compare the statement of Artin's theorem with that of the example from the previous slide. So to remind you, the, the slide before this one started, well, sorry, it ended 
with an answer which was a non-negative real polynomial that is on the current slide. And it started with me giving you summons and telling you to square them and add, and then it turned out that we got the answer on the left. Now, even without knowing the summons in advance, it is not hard to show that the polynomial on the left is non-negative over the reals. So if we know Artin's theorem, it is inevitable that it will be a sum of finitely many squares of rational functions. But how would we build those summons, the four uh, things to be squared, if we had not been given them in advance, knowing only the polynomial on the left? Now here, Artin's statement and his proof are not helpful because they were indirect or non-constructive. Artin proved his result by contradiction. He supposed that there was a non-negative real polynomial function that could not be expressed as a sum of finitely many squares of rational functions. And he obtained a contradiction, thereby establishing the truth of his theorem, but giving you no way of constructing the summons from the original polynomial. Moreover, you could not predict from Artin's work that in the example above, only four summons would be needed, as has turned out to be the case nor could you say anything in advance about the degree types of the summons based on the degree type of the original polynomial. And here I should be more precise about what I mean by the degree of a polynomial with more than one variable and of a rational function. So in the case of the polynomial on the left of the equal sign, I would call that a polynomial of degree six. The idea here is that if you set the variables X and Y equal to each other and simplified, you would get a polynomial involving a term x to the sixth and no higher power of x, so we would call that a polynomial of degree six. What then would we mean by the degree of a rational function? So I have flagged a particular rational function uh, on the slide in green, and before we take the outermost square, uh, what, is, what would we mean by the degree of that rational function? To compute that, you must first cancel any common factors on the numerator and the denominator. If you have already cancelled common factors, then you take the degree of the numerator, the degree of the denominator, you compare them, and the larger one is declared to be the degree of the rational function. So on the numerator, if I equated the variables x and y, I would get a term involving x to the fifth and no higher power of x. On the denominator, we have a polynomial of degree two. Five is greater than two, so I would say that is a rational function of degree five. That's how degree is defined. All right, so Artin, as I said, had a non-constructive proof of his theorem, and he wondered whether it could be made constructive and asked mathematical logicians about this, and that's how mathematical logic entered into the subject. So the situation is somewhat analogous to Axe's theorem that we talked about before, because we've got a structure R, with operations of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And it turns out that the role in Artin's theorem played by this structure of real numbers uh, can be played by any so-called real closed field in the sense that the first order sentences that are true in R are just those that are true in all real closed fields. Again, I'm not going to define real closed fields just as I didn't define algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero, but what matters is that one can write down axioms for real closed fields that are all first order sentences in this language of addition, subtraction, and multiplication, then stand, adding the standard logical axioms and inference rules of first order logic, we get another first order formal theory for real closed fields. And again, we can then apply Gödel's completeness theorem and it tells us that the first order sentences that are true in R, equivalently in all real closed fields, will have formal proofs. And the finite lengths of those formal proofs become extra combinatorial tools that can be used in other arguments, just as they were in the case of Axe's theorem. So to take advantage of that, Abraham Robinson in 1955 used those methods on Artin's equation from his theorem, just remember that on the left there we have a non-negative real polynomial, function P, and it is broken up on the right as a sum of squares of rational functions F1 to Fm. Robinson used the techniques of mathematical logic to show that there is an upper bound K, a number that is simultaneously greater than or equal to 
the number of summons on the right. So that's our M. M is the number of summons required, but K is simultaneously greater than or equal to the degrees of all the summons required. So K is an estimate of how big the right-hand side needs to be. And the important thing here is that this upper bound K depends only on the number of variables on the left, that's N, and on the degree of the polynomial P on the left, does not depend on the coefficients of P. Moreover, this K is a computable function of N and the degree of P. Then in 1955 and in 61, Kreisel and Dakin used different methods, but also from mathematical logic to reduce this upper bound K to a smaller value. Uh, they reduced it from a computable function to a primitive recursive function, which, and I won't define what that means, but it's an improved bound, smaller bound. It's telling us that, the, that we won't need the right-hand side to be bigger than a certain fixed finite amount determined by the number of variables and the degree of the original polynomial. Uh, later in 1967, Albrecht Pfister obtained a result which puts an upper bound, quite a simple upper bound, two to the n, on the number of summons, but disregarding the degrees of the summons F1 to Fm. So if you're interested in bounding the degrees of the summons, then Pfister's result is not helpful. But if you only want to know how many summons will be needed on the right-hand side, Pfister's result said you will not need more than two to the n, where n was the number of variables. And in fact, that bound is attained in the example that I showed you, where it was a case of two to the two, uh, namely four summons that were needed. All right, so the content of this slide shows how mathematical logic can be used uh, to constructivize a non-constructive proof of a theorem, which merely showed the existence of things without telling you how to construct them. And the analysis using tools of mathematical logic, particularly proof theory, uh, is able in some cases to produce extra quantitative information to make the theorem more informative, providing extra information such as upper bounds on the sizes of things whose existence is asserted in the theorem. And that activity of extracting extra quantitative information, for example, bounds, from indirectly proved theorems using techniques of mathematical logic, specifically proof theory, that is nowadays called proof mining. It, the activity was initiated by Georg Kreisel in the 1950s, and he called it the unwinding of proofs. It has made considerable advances in recent decades. And uh, although the examples that I showed you, because I deliberately chose ones that are relatively easy to understand, uh, a more up-to-date guide to the progress of the subject can be found in a book published in 2008 by Ulrich Tollenbach called Applied Proof Theory. All right, so um, I will leave it there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Raftery. Again, any questions to Professor Raftery can be posted to the link in the description below, which may form part of the panel discussion. But due to our time constraints, we may not be able to get to all the questions. Uh, we now take a very short break and we will return with our live panel discussion in just a few moments. And we're live. Uh, oh, uh, we're muted. There we go. And we're live. We are live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. OK, so now we're going to move on to our panel discussion. We will discuss some topics surrounding mathematics from education to mathematics research. But before we go on, we would like to point out that um, we may have some issues with our technical stuff. We are running everything ourselves. Um, but as you know, we are on load shedding stage two, so there may be some connectivity issue, but we'll try our best. Um, and we'd like to apologize in advance if there's uh, going to be technical difficulties. Okay, so um, our panel members are here, and they're all well-established mathematicians with current or former affiliation with the University of Pretoria. Our two speakers, Professor Yashik Banajak and Professor James Raftery, whom you have just heard, uh, have joined us here. Uh, James and Yashek, would you like to say hi? Hello. And Yashek? 
Hello. 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 <laughs> thank you for yeah. Thank you for yes. joining us. Hello. Hello. I think I unmuted myself. Okay. Yes. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. Thanks. And uh, Mick, will you introduce our next panel member, please? Good. Thank you. Either uh, joining us is uh, Professor Kirsten Jordan, a uh, professor at UNISA, but formerly from uh, the University of Pretoria. Uh, professor Jordan is a full professor in the Department of Decision Sciences. Um, she was the first female president of the South African Mathematical Society from uh, 2016 to 2019, and she currently serves as a, uh, executive director of the South African Mathematics Foundation. Uh, Kirsten, would you like to say hi? Yes, hi. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the discussions. Good. Thank you, Kirsten. Yeah, and up next, we have Professor Bernardo Rodriguez, professor at UP. Uh, Professor Rodriguez was born in Angola and throughout his uh, study career, he was awarded the DAAD German Academic Exchange Scholarship as well as Fulbright Scholarship. He joined the University of Pretoria in 2020. And Bernardo, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I very much look forward to the exchange. Okay, and finally, we have Professor Jan Harm van der Waalt, Associate Professor at UP, and he is curr also, currently also the acting head of the department. And he's known among students and staff in the department for his excellence in teaching. He won Departmental Teaching Award and has been nominated for Best First Year Lecture in the Faculty of Na Na Natural and Agricultural Science. Jan Harm, unmute, please. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to take part in today's activities. Okay. Um, so we are all in the in the department or sort of like our day to day life. We are on a first name basis. So from now on, we will uh, start referring to each other with our first names. Um, I hope that's okay. Okay, so um, the Topic for this year's, um, let's say the main theme of this year's uh, International Day of Mathematics is Mathematics for a Better World. We have heard earlier that uh, Jacek mentioned in his lecture about prime numbers being the fundamental tool for encryption. Um, Jacek, we would just like to hear from you. What do you think of the uh, role of mathematics in the current crisis of the pandemic? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, mathematics in the whole fight, well, maybe not the whole, but the major parts of the fight uh, with pandemics. Uh, let us mention that, you know, starting from the basic logic, you must use your basic logic to understand that the more people you meet, the more likely you are to get infected. The less uh, personal protective equipment you use, the more chances uh, are that you are infected, and so on. Uh, but uh, of course, mathematics also is interwoven into a number of other things. Uh, for example, even collection of data, uh, data from uh, coming about COVID are in coming in large numbers, so it's actually big data, and you have to have a lot of very efficient and fast and in some sense, the cluttering algorithms to make them usable for um, to practitioners, in health, health service practitioners. So here you have quite a lot of, of uh, mathematical tools, mathematical sciences, uh, like statistical sciences. Uh, if you think about another uh, application of mathematics here is the question of allocation of beds, respirators, uh, allocation of hospitals for traveling uh, ambulances and so on. It's one of the most typical old mathematical operation research problems, so-called traveling salesman problem. And the last probably the most visible uh, part of modeling here is uh, sorry, of mathematics here is mathematical modeling, so essentially building uh, models uh, which try to predict different scenarios. And these models are behind uh, decisions of practically all governments uh, fighting with the current pandemic. So in some sense, mathematics underpins almost every aspect of the activities. Of course, we cannot fight COVID with mathematics only. 
uh, but but almost all aspects of COVID fight are uh, somehow based on uh, various applications, various tools from the mathematical sciences. Okay, so probably this would be an opening statement. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ashik. Uh, it seems like we're experiencing a little bit of a video issue, so I think I will let Meek, you can... Yes, uh, yeah. so we are experiencing some, uh, it, it appears we're experiencing some lag on the video, so uh, if I could just ask you maybe to turn off your, your webcam, unfortunately that uh, uh, will we'll turn off our webcams and... Uh, it's not ideal to do it that way, yes. but uh, we'll see if that, uh, if that resolves improves. Uh, or improves the uh, the issue. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll see if uh, if any of our uh, uh, backup members from the uh, from the uh, the organizing committee can just let us know whether that uh, improves the the situation. Uh, in the meantime, I think. Um, we should continue our discussion mm -hmm. and um, uh, as uh, as Yasek said uh, the um, uh, mentioned in Yasek's talk the, the the models are always wrong uh, and uh, but we can still we can still make predictions of them and one thing that I noticed uh, uh, in China um, during the very very first parts of the pandemic was when they uh, they built that uh, giant hospital in six days um, why did they do that uh, i i am pretty sure that they saw from their models that oh we're going to run out of beds um Jacek, would you would you like to say something about that well definitely i mean models tell models tell you uh, in which direction the, the epidemic will uh, will evolve? And not, as, as we say, model model will never give you exact answer. Model probably will never uh, give you an answer uh, to the question how many precise how many infections uh, you will have in three months' time. This is the same as with the weather forecast. Uh, you know, the forecast for of a model actually is quite accurate for. One day, two days, maybe the longer in time, the less uh, predictable is the weather. And if you could think, you know, uh, how difficult would be weather forecasting if particles of the air in the atmosphere had minds like humans and behave in irresponsible way, for example, to make most harm to us. The modeling of, of weather would be as almost as impossible as modeling of human behavior. So models are essentially short-term predictions. And models should be treated as uh, informing us on general trends and testing different scenarios. So model is never perfectly correct. Always, if you are using any model, you have always to know what are the assumptions. So the proper mathematical statement about modeling is if conditions A, B, C, D, E are satisfied, then you expect Z or Z or Z. You can never actually say always it will be like that. And model is self-correcting, you know. Humans change behavior because of the models. And then, of course, as soon as humans change behavior, then the model must be updated. So uh, modeling is a constant game with, with the environment, with the external world. But as I said, you know, the role of the model is essentially, first of all, to um, sketch possible trends and to give short-term estimates, short-term predictions. And then possibly uh, later you can update uh, the models to make the next step in the prediction. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ashek. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, model and, um, or earlier we talked about uh, Yashek's mentioning things like prime, the role of prime numbers in, um, in our current technology. And in fact, thanks to technology, we're still able to celebrate um, the International Day of Mathematics today online, um, barring some, <laughs> some uh, technical issues, but it's okay. Um, 
Yeah, since our lockdown uh, back in March to 2020, that's actually right our previous, uh, right after our previous IDM, well, most of the world went on lockdown, and we are all forced to learn how to conduct our lives online. Um, Bernardo, perhaps do you want to share your thoughts on um, what's been happening in your life specifically since the lockdown in 2020? Yes. Thank you, Ida. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yes, um, this is these are quite challenging times in which we are in. And to some degree, we are very privileged to live in times that are as dynamic and fluid as we live in now. In my specific case, one of the things that I felt most impacted in my life both at personal li personal level and research level, have been, from the personal perspective, that I've been able to spend more time with the family. And at the same time, I've been able to also understand a lot more about generosity and tolerance, things that maybe one has neglected for a long time. But from a research perspective, there have been quite dramatic changes in the way that I've been approaching things lately. Uh, and the reason is because I've had more time to stay with myself and interrogate some of the things that I've been doing. And to, ne to an extent that I have gone back into some of the problems that I worked in the past, and I began looking at them in a different way. Um, questions like legacy, for example, have begun to matter for me, asking questions on what is it that I want to leave as a legacy and what kind of work I want to be associated with. And um, to that extent, I've also broadened my horizons in the sense of the collaboration. I mean, and collaboration now has become such an easy thing to do. It's become routine to just make plans with colleagues and meet in any of the platforms. Um, I think, in short, there's been some degree of positive impact in what I have begun doing. And it's simply because of the use of technology. But let me enhance here that had it not been because of the mathematical theory of communication, many of the things that we are able to realize now, we wouldn't have been able to do. And the pioneers of these sciences didn't expect this dimension to have taken place the way it is. I think I'll, I'll stop from at the moment and then see. Yes, if, if anyone else would like to add something uh, mm. to, uh, to their experience of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this entire pandemic that we that we experience, I see uh, uh, Jan Harum's uh, hand is up. Jan Harum, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mick. Uh, yes, what Bernardo was saying a moment ago uh, got me thinking that one of one thing that has happened, which is quite good, uh, is the proliferation of of uh, mathematics webinars. Uh, whereas previously, if you gave a talk, say if I gave a talk at the University of Pretoria, the people who would hear my talk would be uh, people at the University of Pretoria or nearby who would come in for the talk. And uh, because those physical face-to-face uh, -face talks were no longer possible, uh, these talks shifted online, meaning they could reach uh, far more people. So anybody anywhere in the world uh, could potentially listen to a talk given anywhere else in the world. And uh, I think that is uh, uh, quite a positive development. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Haram. Yes, the, um, I, the strangest thing uh, that I feel has happened is, and it is something that I've never experienced before, is uh, that it was the, the entire world uh, was shoved into this uh, situation and everyone at the same time had to learn how to adapt uh, to this uh, uh, to this entire pandemic, which is something that I've never experienced. And it was so strange uh, that uh, uh, how everyone 
was forced at the same time to learn how to how to how to handle everything um, we have a suggestion so it appears that our uh, our connection has uh, stabilized so uh, perhaps the suggestion that we now have is uh, for the speaker, if if someone is speaking, then uh, unmute your microphone and turn. Uh, let's try to turn on uh, the camera, and we'll uh, we'll see uh, if that uh, if uh, if that still works. So uh, when when you start speaking, try to uh, remember to unmute yourself and to uh, turn on your camera. Um, uh, would anyone else like to uh, share anything about uh, their experiences during the pandemic? Uh, Bernardo. Yes. Um, one of the things that got me thinking in the latter days about this has also been on a more geopolitical way that some of the governments that were almost meaningless all of a sudden became relevant because now they have to work hard to save lives or to bring about changes in their communities and um, this i think has been a tremendous shift where people have begun to have place and they've they now matter and they have meaning Definitely. Yeah. Um, shall we maybe move on to our next uh, uh, topic? Yeah, either? sure. Um, so when we uh, have discussed multiple discussions about uh, the celebration of the International Day of Mathematics, uh, so one thing that came up is that, uh, well, we should say this is the elephant in the room. Every time mathematics is brought up in a conversation in South Africa, everyone talked about the Tim's performance of, uh, of South Africa. Um, I think uh, we have Kirsten here, who's probably very familiar with the situation. So Kirsten, would you like to say or share your thoughts about this? Yes, uh, so I can uh, tell you a little bit of the statistics because I think as mathematicians, it's important that we know exactly what we mean when we say that um, the state of maths in education in South Africa is not good. So the uh, TIM study is it's an international study and it uh, stands for Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. And the most recent report was released now in 2019. And it showed that South Africa's grade nine and grade five learners continue to compare very poorly with countries across the world. In fact, consistently across all the tests, we are in the bottom three. Um, with about 40 countries being compared for the grade four, five learner level and about 69 being compared for the grade eight, nine learner category. So um, just to give you the picture, the study classifies 400 points of achievement as the minimum level of competency. So for grade five mathematics, South Africa achieved 374 points uh, this uh, in the latest study, while for uh, grade nine, the learners' mathematics score of 389 is an increase of 17 points uh, for mathematics from the previous study, which was in 2015, but it's still well below this 400 threshold. And to add an additional perspective, the TIM study is actually done for grade four and grade eight learners globally. But South Africa enters grade five and grade nine learners, which means that our grade five and grade nine learners are compared globally to learners a year younger. Um, so apart from the poor performance, another major concern is that only a fraction of grade five and grade nine learners at no fee schools. So the lower quintile one and two schools, schools that are not required where parents don't have to pay a, a school fee. They performed exceptionally, very few of them performed exceptionally well in mathematics in this in the study. So it again just highlights the discrepancy in the mathematics performance between our mostly more rural schools and the um, schools that are uh, more advantaged and have access to uh, better teachers, better facilities, etc. Uh, another particular concern in the latest report is the number of students with achievements 
described as too low for estimation. So a student is considered to have an achievement too low for estimation if their performance on the assessment was no better than could be achieved by simply guessing on the multiple choice assessment form. And for our grade, uh, for our grade five mathematics, 6% scored too low. And 26% scored too low for our grade nines. So all of this is, is quite shocking once one hears it for the first time. And it's happening in an environment where there is actually quite a lot of money being spent on um, in, in our education system on a primary and high school education. If you compare the data to other countries, we are spending proportionally a large amount of our uh, gross domestic project uh, 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 GDP on education compared to other countries where one actually just should though take note that our GDP is smaller than most of those other countries. But it is a very complex problem and it really is the elephant in the room in the sense that we've all gotten used to the situation, uh, but it's nowhere close to acceptable. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think everyone is aware of the problem, but it's such a complex problem that uh, uh, no one, no one knows how to how to tackle the problem, um, and uh, I the I think the the economical aspect of it should not be understated. That uh, um, uh, uh, our our economy is slightly struggling, and I I I'm of the opinion that uh, uh, it will be very slow improving until until we get our economy uh, firing on all cylinders. Yeah. Uh, does yeah, it, yeah. Go ahead, Kirsten. Yeah, once you get me started on this, I might not stop. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is very complex. So uh, we have under uh, qualified and uh, under prepared teachers that are not uh, well enough familiar with the familiar, the, uh, the, the curriculum, the math training is not high enough. And there's um, the recent con conversation that I had with people at the DBE, uh, the Department of Basic Education, is that at the, the stage there's actually 10 schools in our countries that do not have a maths teacher, not even, yeah. never mind, an uh, English teacher teaching mathematics or a science teacher or whatever, biology teacher teaching mathematics. They do not have one single mathematics teacher. Yeah. So there's a huge shortage for properly qualified um, teachers. And uh, it is more marked in the rural areas. So to me, I see it as sort of the danger of it being a, a downward spiral, that it's just going to get worse. Because if you have people not being taught at school, how can they produce new teachers? Mm. Uh, so we're not getting people into the system that are able to A, uh, cope with studying to be a teacher, uh, because we're not getting enough people coming into the system to become engineers, never mind teachers. And nobody wants to become a teacher anymore. Um, so your talented students are not looking at becoming teachers. So it's a little bit of a, the, you know, it's, it's, I don't mean to sound negative, but I'm very concerned about it. And from the Mass Foundation's point of view, we try very hard to have products where we do professional development of teachers. Mm, so that those teachers that are there are equipped to cope better with the curriculum and how to teach the curriculum for understanding um, sort of problem solving approaches as opposed to just saying this is the rule and that's what you do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. It is perhaps a, a stigma that um, being a teacher is not as, um, as cool <laughs> as being an engineer or something like this. So I think it's very dangerous yeah. if society does not um, appreciate uh, yeah. uh, teachers. Yeah, it is. It is very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, shall we see? So if, oh, sorry, Kirsten, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, you can. Please, the others should chip in. But yeah. I did. I did want to bring a positive note to this as well, rather than just complaining what's going on at schools. Um, in this meeting that I spoke about uh, last week with the Department of Basic Education, they uh, released some figures. Well. They explained, I asked the question, and they explained some of the preliminary research on the reasons for a positive development. And that is that our uh, metric distinction 
uh, rate, the number of distinctions in mathematics has gone up quite a lot. It's about 68%. Uh, 2020, uh, 2019, it was 4,415, and now it was 7,424. And I suppose one can be cynical and have all kinds of negative explanations for that. You could say, well, the paper was leaked, or, you know, the, it's just becoming more predictable, and it's you know, those things are true. But the research seems to show that that the actual reason for it is that um, those learners that had access to all of the support that was made available to them um, to get through matric despite the lockdowns and the school shutting down, etc., they grabbed that opportunity and they took responsibility or ownership for their own learning and um, benefited from that. And all of that will probably also mean that they'll be better prepared for university. Hmm. Um, so that to me was a positive aspect and I, and I do hope that that will continue be also with our, with our university students. I hope yes. so. Uh, uh, we've got a hand up from Jan Harren. Uh, go ahead, Jan Harren. Uh, thanks, Mick. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that the number of distinctions went up quite dramatically for the matrix. Uh, I did notice uh, something similar, a similar trend last year when I was teaching first year calculus in the first semester, in that the um, at the top of the spectrum, the perform there were there was actually a, some improvement. I think more students did quite well. Uh, unfortunately, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, kind of uh, the bottom kind of fell out. So a lot of students who would have normally scraped by on a 50, uh, just didn't make it. So uh, I think that's a, that's another opportunity that you get while doing things well, by uh, the, the online environment in which we now operate is that it gives the student the opportunity to become much more uh, self-directed uh, in their learning. But then uh, that means the student must grab that opportunity. Yes, the, the uh, ha yeah, uh, self-directedness requires you di to direct yourself, uh, which is, yeah, uh, even uh, uh, I'm sure all of us have experienced uh, in our lives lack of motivation. And mm. it is, uh, uh, we, should, we should perhaps pay attention to, to teaching kids on how to motivate themselves. Um, I see Yasik has uh, uh, has his hand up. Yasik, go ahead. Okay. Hello. Um, one of the things which is important here is the culture of looking for excuses among, you know, in our education system. Uh, so mm. we uh, are in some sense prevented in, at universities to applying, let us say, normal standards because everybody is concerned about pass rates and something like that. And it is coming back, you know, uh, there is a quite uh, famous person, uh, Dr. Makozi Koza, which was, she used to be ANST MP. And then she, about two weeks ago, she very clearly said that, you know, if the National Education Department announces that it will top up the marks, to artificially give extra marks by an addition of 5% to help students to get through the academic year, she claims that this does more harm than good. And quoting her, the world is not looking for 30%. For example, I would not hire a person coming to a company with a 30% matric rate over somebody who has 80%. So this is a false sense of well-being if you pass a lot of people simply by adding odd marks here, odd marks there, giving extra help, guiding, taking, you know, a person by the hand and pushing this person through. You know, I don't think that if you are going to play professional rugby in South Africa, 
you will be getting extra five percent if you don't perform yeah. <laughs> in your test. You know, you yeah. must perform. I, I don't the see. Same must be applied, you, this must, the same must be applied in mathematics in any other activity. Yes. Otherwise, I, you will be on the down, down line, uh, Sorry, down down spiral. Yeah, I don't. I don't see <laughs> Australia Australia agreeing to to South Africa starting with five extra points uh, yes. uh, in the in the in the World oh, Cup yeah. final because uh, because ABC. <laughs> So yeah, um, measuring measuring uh, uh, performance objectively, I think, is uh, is uh, uh, quite quite important. Um, Jan Haram had his hand up briefly. I actually saw James's hand. Was it James's hand? Um, but uh, perhaps let's. Uh, no, let's... my my hand was not up. James's hand was not up. But let's. Um, uh, uh, there's another thing that I would like to bring up, and that is the 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 fear of mathematics that in the in the general population, where um, uh, whenever well, I'm sure all of us have had the experience. You tell someone, oh, yeah, well, I'm a mathematician, and then they said, oh, I uh, I, and then they kind of get nervous, and uh, it's like, oh, I was never any good at at, at mm. mathematics. And, uh, perhaps that that comes from uh, maybe from the 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 education system from 30 to 50 years ago where where uh, teachers would would stand with a with a rod and and uh, hand out corporal punishment and that kind of thing which discouraged mm. the making of mistakes which i i i don't think is a very good thing yeah. um uh, to to discourage making mistakes i would i would rather uh, encourage the 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 uh, the uh, uh, let's call it metacognitive skill of understanding the mistake and understanding why I I made the mistake rather than than meeting out punishment. Um, but yeah, speaking of mistakes and and failures or in, in mathematics uh, and things like that. Um, so we talked about encouraging um, people to learn. When they when they make mistakes, and in fact, many mathematical discoveries actually uh, they were, they were born out of um, mistakes or failures or misconceptions and uh, that kind of uh, situation. So, uh, James, perhaps do you want to share a thing or two about this? Uh, yes, um, my load shedding is just about to start. I've got my hotspot on. <laughs> But uh, if I cut out, I'll try to reconnect. Okay, we'll we'll take it as so, it comes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think there are two kinds of mistake. There's uh, blunders and wrong expectations, and both of them can actually be productive. Um, in the history of mathematics, there are a couple of uh, well, there's several fam famous examples of this. Um, one goes all the way back to Euclidean geometry, uh, where Euclid uh, had a fifth. Uh, axiom, which said that uh, given a line and a point that's not on that line, there's exactly one line. Okay, it seems like oh, we I have... Oh, I think we just lost, we just lost James, James in, <laughs> the middle, me, yeah. in think... the middle of his uh, explanation. Uh, if if someone else would yeah, like to pick up from and... here. Oh, wait, one, one moment. Oh, I James. think James is back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, so uh, he uh, felt that this ought to be a self-evident property of space and that it should be provable from his other axioms. And he tried but failed to do that. And uh, for about 2000 years, mathematicians did the same, trying to prove this. And uh, this led uh, geometers like Zachary to produce a lot of work in which uh, they assumed that Euclid's parallel postulate was false proved a lot of theorems, but in the hope of obtaining a contradiction and never obtained the contradiction. And what eventually happened was that, I mean, it's, there is no contradiction. The parallels postulate doesn't follow from the other axioms. And there are models uh, of, for example, hyperbolic geometry in which uh, the other axioms hold and the parallels postulate does not. And the work of Zachary ended up laying the foundation impossible, but his work uh, now constitutes a firm uh, 
uh, beginning to hyperbolic geometry. And then this became actually uh, more important at the beginning of the 20th century uh, with Einstein's work in physics, where hyperbolic geometry was actually needed, as opposed to the pioneers of non-Euclidean geometry in the 19th century, who, for whom it was just an intellectual curiosity. So that was uh, a case of uh, productively pursuing a wrong expectation. Um, another famous one concerns the uh, treatment of infinitesimally small quantities in mathematics. And uh, this already worried the ancient Greek mathematicians, but it became particularly significant when Newton and Leibniz developed the differential and in integral calculus. Uh, in their work, infinitesimally small quantities, uh, Newton's fluxion, the delta x, um, are, are dealt with, but in an unrigorous manner. And um, uh, this caused quite a lot of suspicion. Um, but at the same time, it was very successful, both in terms of mathematics and in terms of scientific uh, applications. Uh, at the same time, uh, an embarrassment set in about it, and that provoked uh, mathematicians like Weierstrass in the 19th century to fix things up and eliminate infinitesimals from real analysis, which was done successfully, and a lot of uh, good mathematics flowed from that. But then, in a sense, another mistake set in, and that was uh, because this had been done successfully, there was an expectation that infinitesimals had now been shown to be um, self-contradictory. Bertrand Russell, uh, early in the 20th century, actually described them as unnecessary, erroneous, and self-contradictory. And that, too, was wrong. Um, in real analysis, one can uh, get by without infinitesimals and uh, on a perfectly rigorous basis, but it doesn't mean that infinitesimal quantities are self-contradictory. And uh, in the 1960s, Abraham Robinson put them on a firm foundation again. But in fact, even at the beginning of the 20th century, it should have been evident um, contradictory because if you start with the real numbers, it is not that difficult to build a model that has the same uh, real ordered field, uh, the same ordered field properties as the real numbers, and contains copies of the real numbers in it, but which also contains infinitesimal and infinite quantities as well. Mm. At any rate, uh, uh, each of these uh, events provoked the next one, and the ultimate pain was uh, quite productive. Uh, mathematics, I think, has a, a self-correcting capacity, although sometimes it takes a very long time. Yes, it is. Uh... Um, yeah, that, that also, uh, perhaps, yeah, um, if we could bring in frustration, uh, I, I sometimes teach uh, uh, the beginnings of real analysis and I, I always make a point of, of pointing out to students that uh, humanity as a whole uh, has been struggling with the, with the infinitesimal and with the infinite for thousands of years <laughs> and it's okay if you are a little bit frustrated and if you have uh, have a little bit of difficulty <laughs> understanding it uh, and we are we are trying to teach it to you in three weeks where uh, where uh, uh, humanity has been struggling with it for for thousands and thousands of years so uh, the frustration is normal and it is yeah. okay uh, i see jan harum has raised his hand jan harum go ahead uh yes uh, thank you uh, I just want to make a comment about mistakes. So, uh, the kinds of mistakes or misconceptions that James uh, described were and didn't, didn't that lead to very productive things. And I think it's important that students of mathematics realize that making a mistake is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but not all mistakes can lead to something productive. So, there's a big difference, I think, what James called a blunder. Mm. Uh, and making a conceptual mistake. Right? So, in other words, not understanding something properly. Mm -hmm. uh, from that, you can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and not just in the, in the research field, where I myself have often thought something would work in a specific way and tried it for a long time and then realized it doesn't work in that way and then understood things much better afterwards. Mm -hmm. As, and, but it, can, it works equally well when you're learning mathematics, that you're making a, a conceptual mistake somewhere, but then you must actively look at your mistake and understand why it's wrong. Mm. Yeah, kind, so, of, kind of be productive in your mistake yes, making. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you've made a mistake in an assignment or a test. Uh, don't just go, ugh, 
four out of ten and throw it in the dustbin. Yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. Find out why. Yeah. I understand what's wrong. You know. Yeah. There's the, the something other... unpleasant has happened. It's admitted being wrong is not pleasant. Yeah. Something <laughs> pleasant has happened, but you know you should use it in a productive way. Mm -hmm. Uh, this has provoked a lot of discussion. I think Jacek was first, and then we'll go to Bernardo and then to Kirsty. So Jacek, go ahead. Okay, just two possibly quick comments. Uh, one, uh, somebody, I think, yeah, this is a quote from somebody I don't remember now. Uh, if, if you start learning a foreign language, you don't after, and you don't speak fluently after three or four weeks, you somehow don't give up. You know, you know that to, 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 to get a basic understanding of foreign language, you need to spend several years. And in mathematics, you know, after quite often people, you know, oh, I, I cannot understand this after one or two days. And, and you know, this is, this is the end mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, um, in the same sense, going back to my example, you know, if you, if you join professional football or rugby or athletic club, you know, it's not that in two weeks, you will be getting, you know, yeah. uh, your scores. You know, it's a long, long, painful process of mistaking, of correcting mistakes. And the other one, uh, in some sense, which sort of like connects with what Jan Harman and James said, in one of the most famous physicists uh, of our times, Richard Feynman, said that he never forgets about his mistakes in blind alleys because he always keeps them in the back of his mind because quite often you know an unexpected connection can be made mm. and actually the blunt alley opens up mm. so never you know understand your mistakes but never forget never throw them away mm -hmm. mm. understand them never throw them away mm -hmm. okay thanks uh, Bernardo go ahead yeah quite an interesting set of um, events indeed um, I do then understand that the idea really here is to tell people that ought, they ought to be resilient and they have to insist, but not just blindly. They ought to insist with um, learning in the end. I um, will tell a quick story between myself and either. Last year we thought one WTW164, and I mean, two seasoned brains we got stuck in one problem that we kept on phoning each other and saying, hmm, I don't think this is right. Something here is not right. And, uh, and this was a first year problem that we were dealing with and we realized, no, either the statement is wrong or we are too tired and we should just give it up for now and come back to it again. It was and, minute by, <laughs> and minute by minute, we kept changing our minds and saying, no, wait. I think we're going in the wrong position, the wrong direction. Mm. We, we should rather look at it again. And the more we looked at it, the more it became clear to us that the statement had a problem yeah. and we needed to look at it again. And these, we're talking to people who've been teaching for a while and should know better, but we did get stuck. Yeah. So this is just to tell students and whoever is interested in learning uh, a subject which has an abstract component and it, which has a dimension of difficulties that insisting and being there and looking at it again in whichever or however many ways, it pays out. Mm. It, uh, it does pay. I remember mistakes I've made when I was an undergraduate, which I now go back to them and say, what? <laughs> really? And, and I mean, some of them were really bland, as James put them. Yeah. Others were gross mistakes. Yeah. And thanks to some of those gross mistakes, I've then begun discovering a direction for my own research. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, it's and great also, to make these mistakes. Also, yeah. uh, uh, the, the more experience one gets, the more uh, one realizes that just because it is in print does not mean that it is actually correct. That's so the, true, it, yeah. uh, um, I've I've learned a healthy skepticism of uh, of uh, 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 let's say printed mathematics and and questioning 
does this actually make sense? And then realizing later, oh, this is actually this is a, this is a problem in the yeah. in the statement of the of the of the question. Yeah. Um, I saw that Kirsten's hand was up, but is now not raised anymore. Kirsten, would you like to uh, no, come in? Yeah, I just left it down because you had acknowledged it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be a bit devil's advocate and, and, and because there's, I'm getting contradictory messages from, from my panel uh, colleagues. Um, so James said he used the word blunder and wrong expectations. And he said that both can lead to productive mathematics. But when Jan Harm spoke, I think he was sort of saying blunder is mm, mm, not so good. Um, so. From my experience, I've sat in lectures with Jan Harum is one. There's no maybe rebuttal, I'm, maybe. <laughs> maybe I misunderstood you, all right. But uh, from my experience, I've sat in international conferences where a speaker has said something wrong. And the audience, either to, to the speaker's face or afterwards, is quite mean right mm -hmm. i mean it's it's mathematicians of are, are an arrogant species and they don't <laughs> really uh, um, tolerate mistakes so it is a tough world out there and from a student's perspective mm -hmm. uh, i remember when i was a student i would never ever open my mouth in a class and try and answer a question because i was too petrified that I might make that mistake, mm. that I have got some misconception, etc. And over the years, although I'm now supposedly a seasoned mathematician, a bit of that fear is still there. And it's mm. got to do with your confidence in your own ability to do something. And when I'm facing a new bit of mathematics or something that I'm not familiar with, I have to every time fight with myself that you actually will be able to understand it. You might not understand it immediately, but just spend some time on it. And, and um, don't let the, the anxiety about not understanding it immediately debilitate you. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm, I don't think I'm alone in feeling like this. And I think it's important that students know that, that we're not all necessarily confident enough to make mistakes and that it can be a tough world out there. Mm. For me, I solved it by having some people that I trust. Um, and in fact, you'll most, all my collaborators are people that I was first friends with yeah. before I became uh, mm. worked with them on mathematics because I had to trust them enough to be able to admit, look, I don't understand this thing that you've written or that you're saying or whatever, so, uh, and then I could move on from there. Yeah. We, we uh, w once had a discussion with one of our students, uh, uh, Walt van Amstel, where we uh, devised a little song that uh, well, uh, trust is the most important <laughs> thing, not just in life, but also in mathematics. So we want to write uh, a country song <laughs> with, this, uh, with this lyric. <laughs> I, see, I see Jan Harum's uh, hand is up. Go ahead, Jan Harum. Is this a rebuttal, maybe, from Jan Harum? <laughs> no, not exactly a rebuttal. So I, I just want to say I, I slightly misspoke mm. in speaking of blunders. I had in mind making kind of careless mistakes mm. which are not conceptual okay uh, those are, they have very little value except in teaching you to be more careful mm. Mm. um but uh yeah i also want to latch on to what kirsten was saying about perseverance um and and yes i mentioned this before as well that so there's this perception that mathematics is hard and in some way it is Mm. Uh, but I think one of the big reasons why it is hard is because it takes a lot of time and effort to master it. And this is true, I think, for mathematicians as much as for non-mathematicians. To master a new piece of math mathematics takes some serious time and effort. Um, and one shouldn't be discouraged if you can't get it in the first five minutes or something. Mm. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I... I, I uh, like what Kirsten said about that we even seasoned mathematicians, it's still unpleasant when we make mistakes. Um, oh. And yes, <laughs> I, I feel that too. Um, but as we agreed, the response is very important when we make mistakes. Is our response mm -hmm. going to be petrified by it? Or are we going to make something productive out of it? 
And I think these stories of um, new mathematics being born out of um, misconception, mistakes, failures, um, we, it should inspire us, I think, to uh, yeah. not be petrified from the mistakes and learn from it. And, um, and yeah, I think uh, that's something that is, uh, that is very important. Um, yeah. Kirsten, um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to add one more thing about that, because mm -hmm. it actually was a conversation between you and me just recently. Correct. <laughs> uh, so it's this whole issue of con confidence and how you handle something. So I have a healthy awareness of that. There are other mathematicians that are much better at mathematics than me. I don't know how to say it. They're quicker. They understand concepts. Uh, but I, with time, can figure most things out. It's just frustrating sometimes when it mm. takes me long. Um, but I was reviewing a paper and there was a step that was really crucial to making a decision base. Uh, it was the main result, part of the main result of the proof, the proof of the main result. And I just wasn't, I was tired probably by then, but anyway, I, I couldn't make sense of it. And I, mentioned this to my husband and he said well why don't you ask somebody and i thought well who on earth do i ask you know and then eventually i thought oh, i'll phone Ida." <laughs> <laughs> and um Ida then had the uh, confidence to say to me look i i can look at it and uh discuss and and maybe i'll i'll see it but usually i find it takes me a while to to figure things for me to review a paper takes a week whereas if i ask can i mention his name yeah sure <laughs> What's a board call? then it takes him he reviews a paper in a day why don't you try him now i don't really know martin volto but i have met him a few times but i decided i was desperate enough and i didn't want to spend another two days on this one step in a proof and um so i found him and then he, he did quite quickly point out and it was quite trivial the step actually, you know, I, I probably would have figured it out after a while. But the point is that uh, to have the confidence to understand that even if you are slower than the guy, there's always somebody better than you. Mm, always. always. I think even, even James and Yasek and Bernardo and Jan Haram, I think you understand that there are people that are better. We're not all Fields medalists, etc. <laughs> so just have a healthy understanding of where you're at and don't put yourself down unnecessarily. Mm. Um, uh, and, and learn from where you have gotten it right. Yeah. Give yourself the credit for that, where yeah. you figured something out and celebrate that yeah. moment as well. Yeah. Uh, we've got a hand up from Jan Harum and then we'll go to Bernardo. Uh, Jan Harum, go ahead. Uh, yeah, again, just uh, uh, res latching onto what Kirsten is saying, uh, I still get nervous every time I give a talk. And, you know, at the end, some guy at the back is going to raise his hands and go, oh, sorry. I think your theorem is wrong. <laughs> Just have to get this. <laughs> um, but then, an important thing that Kirsten has, has been talking about is 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 um, having people to talk to. And so, if you're stuck on something, it's okay to to talk to your friends about it. And this, I say, in both you know, in terms of professional mathematicians and in terms of students. I mean. Talking about the mathematics, even if the other guy doesn't give you the answer, and very often they don't, uh, just verbalizing your difficulty often helps you to understand the problem better. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we are very used to mathematics being something that you write, but I think it needs to be more something that you talk. Well I mean, said. Talking about it is, is an important part of learning it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well said, well uh, said. Uh, Bernardo, go ahead. Yes, Jan Harm superseded me in a way. <laughs> I think he's um, sort of entered my mind and read what I was thinking. But just uh, complimenting a bit and also latching on what Kerstin was saying. One important detail that Kerstin pointed out is that she recognizes healthily that she is not the best out of the best. But she pointed out of something that we are not Fields medalist, even the Fields medalist have that moment. Justin, this is just to assure you that mm -hmm. those low moments happen to almost all of us, including the Fields medalist. <laughs> <For all laughs> when, 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 when you hear them speak and tell a story about their 
trajectory, you, you just can't believe that they've gone so low sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's healthy to recognize that, yes, one's intellectual ability to recognize something, it's not as immediate as others, that's okay. But with the important part that Kerstin said, and this is why I'm pulling from her, is that she eventually gets the time to see it. Mm. This, is, this is key. Mm. Eventually get that convincing moment which says, aha, I got it. Yeah. And this, I mean, it's a healthy state. It's, it's also rewarding for ourselves. Yeah. Even from a point of view of our well-being, it's important because it gives us that assurance that we are doing well and we are okay. That's the celebration moment that Kerstin pointed out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important to have that. And, and it's important also to pass on to the students that, as Jan Harm said, having somebody to talk to mm. and verbalizing one's thought, it's important. Even if one doesn't get an immediate answer or no answer at all, it's, it's also part of one's vocabulary. And often times I've seen colleagues talking to themselves <laughs> about what, what they're doing. And one, generally that's how we are perceived. These people talk to themselves. Talk, they're almost all the time in their head. That's what people say of us. Yeah. But it's okay to be in one's head because when one is in one's head, one is in that process of making a thought process become a word and verbalizing it is important as yeah. as Jan, Jan Arms really said and yeah. Jan Arms put it in the way that it, it just best said yeah. I won't add any word to that again yeah, yeah. okay so um oh we uh, time. <laughs> uh, yeah we're, we're running out of time uh, let's uh, briefly go to Jan Harm and then I think we'll we'll go move on to our final topic okay Jan so, Harm I see your hand is yeah, up. But James has had his hand uh, up I just James? maybe my hands are confused sorry I forgot to take my hand oh, up. Uh, Jan Harm forgot to, to <laughs> take just, his hand yeah, down okay uh, so um I, I I want to bring up uh, an, a question from the audience um and perhaps I will pile on this question, so it's kind of like a two-part question. So the question is, uh, this person is interested in mathematics and computers and asking about what would be the best degree to pursue for someone like, uh, for someone like this, this student. I, 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 I'm assuming he's probably going to start university soon. Um, but to, to add on that, I think over the years, I've, uh, we've met many talented students um, in our uh, sort of teaching uh, days <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm always very glad to see students who are enthusiastic, who are um, extremely interested in mathematics and always ask questions and that kind of thing. Um, but in the university context, it's kind of nice because you can approach your lecturer and then ask them questions. But say you're a student um, sitting in uh, high school, perhaps as Kirsten said, unfortunately, you're from one of these schools that, you know, you're uh, not so fortunate in the uh, mathematics uh, teacher sort of um, department, so to say. Um, where can you get help? Where can you uh, get resources? Should we maybe uh, get a, whoever wants to chip in to this, these two questions? So what, uh, degree to pursue if someone's interested in mathematics and computer? And um, and computing and okay, Jan Har, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, right. So I can only speak about how it is done at the University of Victoria. I, I don't know about other universities. Um, so of course, so you have two options. You can take option A, which is to do mathematics or applied mathematics with computer science as an elective, which you can do, or to do computer science and then take mathematics mathematics as an elective. Um, and, um, well, a little, perhaps some personal bias, but I would go for the maths or applied maths option uh, for only one reason. Well, there's two reasons, but the one is not important. <laughs> uh, the other one is that I think it is easier to take, you see, the thing is you want to do both so that when you finish with your degree, you have a choice sort of which one to go for. And I think... Uh, that may be slightly easier to do mathematics with a computer science elective. 
because you will need to do about four mathematics modules at, 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 at the third year level to do an honors in mathematics. Uh, and that may not be possible uh, in the way that the computer science degree is structured. There may not be space for that many electives. And this is an unfortunate side effect of, of, of how degrees at universities generally, or at least at Victoria, is structured, that it's very rigid. Um, Same. Then, Same. Uh, yeah, ex extra resources. I know the University of Pretoria, the junior Taki, runs a, a sort of math program. So that's one place to look. Uh, I mean, our department, uh, Henry Wiggins and, and Ruan Kellerman, they are very involved with the uh, Mathematics Olympiad program. So it's another place an, uh, an interested high school student can go. Uh, but maybe Kirsten can say more. She's uh, very involved in these things. Yeah, all right. So there, there are many, many online resources. Uh, locally, you can look um, at the Maths Foundation website. Uh, there's a lot of things linked to the Olympiads. Um, on there. Um, and then also locally, there's AMSEC, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences Secondary School Enrichment Center. That's what AMSEC stands for. Uh, they have a lot of uh, resources on their website too. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the studying mathematics and computers, so you can think wider as well if you don't want to necessarily do a mathematics or computer science degree and you have maybe uh, some interests in, in subjects, say for example, geography, then there's degrees like uh, geo-information specialists. They do some mathematics, some computer science, uh, depending on which university. Uh, they either do informatics or computer science. Usually it's better than probably to choose an option where they do more computer science and then geography. So they do this whole, like if you look at Google Maps, or they, they take data and spatially represent it. Mm. And for that, you need all of those skills. So there's several degrees like that that mix various fields of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, uh, approach your, your local or nearest university. Yeah. Uh, look at YouTube as much as you yeah. can. There's lots of resources around. Yeah. Um, I saw Yasek had his hand up. Go ahead, Yasek. Well, uh, probably me. I, I lowered my hand, but, but if I will, you know, since I was called. I mean, in some sense, uh, I, I you know, concur with Jan Harm and with Kerstin. You know, in some sense, it's a lot of Mm, a lot of, in some sense, uh, how to say it, a lot of flavors of computer science and depends on what you really want to do. If you are interested in theoretical computer science languages, algorithms, then probably it's better to go for, for mathematics because mathematics will give you better foundation and then later switch slowly into into more computer science applications mm. uh, but if you are interested like for example i think at up computer science is in the engineering department mm. so if, if you are more interested in, in engineering computer science hardware this type of stuff then of course uh, mathematics is then a little bit more secondary yeah. and yeah. the other the other option is soft option uh, like like information technology when it's more or less probably to computer science, like math literacy to uh, mathematics. So, so, but then still it's useful. Yeah. So the, the, the problem much depends. Uh, I mean, I would just, just simply to, to, to want to, to conclude, uh, you know, I would always say it's better to start with mathematics. <laughs> uh, just quoting, quoting one of the greatest mathematicians, functionalist, Hugo Steinhaus, who said that mathematicians will always do it better. It may take him longer time but you do better yeah we are we are all biased we're uh, all biased in, here in, yes. in that sense. Uh, i see jan harren's hand is up maybe a last comment from jan harren uh, sorry I'm, I'm i'm still not used to having to oh, lower my oh, lower yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, well in uh, in uh, in real life that uh, that happens automatically yes that yes. is the, <laughs> the uh, one, of, on Google Meet. <laughs> one of the advantages of real life okay Maybe one final question because we're running out of time. Um, so one final question from the audience to James. Um, this is from, well, if you're teaching at UP, you know who the student is. It's from Adrian de Klerk. Uh, he said, thank you for the wonderful talk. 
You spoke of the impact of logic on mathematics. Do you know of examples of how to study the uh, how the study of logic had an impact on philosophy? Uh, yes, uh, this is a long. Uh, Oh, we are, um, we're we're experiencing yeah. a little bit of connectivity issues. Uh, James, just yeah, I think I yeah. think James just uh, uh, let's just everyone switch off their, uh, their camera. so the cameras. Yeah. In fact, uh, back well in the ancient hall, uh, trying to reconnect. Hear me? Yes, now we yeah. can hear you. Yeah, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. just uh, just uh, switch and, off and your there, camera. There is, yes, I'll yeah. switch off my yeah. camera. Uh, then there's there's also some work in the medieval period, and then there's a, a kind of a big gap, and then um, in the late 19th and um, and then the 20th century, there was a considerable interaction between uh, logic and philosophy. In a sense, I think that is <clears throat> less true now, uh, perhaps because um, big developments took place in the 20th century, and um, uh, these things come in waves. But um, uh, yes, um, I, I think uh, for a large part of the 20th century, logic was an essential uh, ingredient in the training of philosophers. As I say, that might be less so now. Hmm. Okay, thank you, James. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to... Okay, um, I think we we can talk for hours on these issues <laughs> but uh, we shouldn't hold up people too long on the uh, on on the stream but i would like to again thank all the uh, panel members to bernardo to jan harm to kirsten and both yashek and james uh, also for their lectures which i found very inspiring <laughs> maybe we can all try to switch on the camera real quick to, to sort of uh, uh, <laughs> our sort of Thank you also to the audience for tuning in. And we just want to also thank um, the organizing committee members. It's not just the two of us. Uh, there are many of us, uh, some staff members, some students, and we would like to thank all of them for their continuous support. Uh, we also would like to thank the UP Department of Institutional Advancement for helping us with the marketing. And last but not least, the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics for their constant support. Whenever we say we want to organize an event, they always very supportive in uh, in helping us with with uh, all sorts of troubles. <laughs> so we would like again thank you everybody. Thank you to Bernardo, to Jan Harum, Kirsten, James, Yashek, Meek, and, uh, and thank you. Either. <laughs> yeah, and thank you to thank the you audience for, for tuning in. Thank you, Darren. Okay. And Meek, you know, for taking part in this event. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for spending your, your, your Sunday with us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for yeah. your time. Thank so you. this, okay. this concludes our panel discussion. Yeah. Um, however, the uh, uh, International Day of Mathematics continues in a couple of hours time at yeah. two o'clock. Please join us on our Discord channel for some uh, mathematical